Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. It's a pretty familiar sound inside a bar. Increasingly, what's going in those drinks is missing something that used to be front and center. So we have lemon juice. Uh, we have one ounce of egg whites, rosemary syrup, and then we have some strawberry puree. Then we also have an ounce and a half of Lumet non-alcoholic gin. This non-alcoholic drink is called the Shut Up and Dance, by the way. And then for the garnish, what we're going to have is going to be a dehydrated lime. Nigel Pike is one of the owners of the Cascade Room in Vancouver, and he says they are seeing more demand for drinks like that. Uh, we've seen a change in the way that people do engage with alcohol. We're definitely seeing you know, the, the younger uh, demographic wanting to really not necessarily go to the higher alcohol drinks, um, be much more controlled in the way they, they drink. You know, they're really looking for something that they can, they can still enjoy with friends. It still looks like a fantastic cocktail. It still had the same level of curation, um, but still obviously gives something different as opposed to your choices that were before, which was a pop, you know, an orange juice or something like that. Now it comes in a fancy glass, you know. Nearly 25% of Canadians choose not to drink. Caitlin Walsh-Miller has explored what is known as the Sober Curious Movement, both as a participant and a researcher. She recently wrote a story about it in McLean's magazine. Caitlin, good morning. Good morning. What does that idea of Sober Curious mean to you? I think it reflects um, this desire to think more about what we're drinking. Alcohol is so normalized and it's been such a default in every aspect of our socialization for so long. Um, it's just putting a bit more mindfulness, a bit more thought behind uh, what you're choosing to drink or not drink. People have used that word, right? Mindful drinking. Mm -hmm. What does that look like in, in practice? For me, it's maybe say at the end of a work day and thinking, oh, I'd like a beer, but then thinking, what, what do I actually want and why do I want it? And now what I'll do is I'll reach for like a non-alcoholic beer or a non-alcoholic cocktail first and ride the wave and see how that does. And then if I still feel like I want to drink after that, maybe I'll have one or maybe I won't. Most, most often I tend to have like forgotten all about it. Why did you choose to do this? Because it's not going sober, sober. I mean, as I said, it's sober curious. Why, why did you make that step? For me, it was about a year after the new guidelines, the new low-risk guidelines came out last January. For me, it was this year, and I'd had a year to let them kind of settle in. And I had just more people in my circles were, were reducing their intake. And I noticed that, you know, I didn't feel great even after just a couple of glasses of wine the next day. I might not feel necessarily super energetic, super sharp. Um, so it was just about doing what I could to, to change that. These are the guidelines that essentially, it was a dramatic reduction in what was classified as safe alcohol consumption, but also essentially said that no amount of alcohol is actually healthy for you. That's right. Yeah. So now that you are kind of experimenting, if I can put it that way, with being sober curious, how do you feel? I mean, have you, have you noticed a, a difference in this? I do. I mean, I think I want to be clear with my my own reduction is kind of I still I still drink fairly regularly, um, but I'm doing uh, less booze, better booze. So I'm trying to drink things that I enjoy more um, and less frequently. I feel um, I feel sharper. I feel like I have more energy. I feel like I have more time. I've got two little kids at home that uh, are in short supply, so grateful for them. Do you feel like you're missing out on anything? Oh, absolutely not. And yeah. I think that has to do with um, what, what we heard about in the intro. There are all these new products, new drinks, whether they're like from a can from the corner store or whether you're getting them out in a bar where you can still like scratch a lot of those itches. It's like a complex, delicious beverage. It feels like you're celebrating. It, it matches the season. You can pair with your food. There's, there's so many options. So definitely not. You went to try out a bunch of those um, drinks, the things that, that, as you said, people can get in, in a number of different places now as part of this dry pub crawl. Tell me a little bit about this. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was, I, I took my husband out on a date, uh, and he's been sober for 13 years this summer. And I feel like he's often along for the ride. You know, if we're going out 
doing a pub crawl, going to a restaurant and I'm having a few drinks, he's just, he's not just there, but it, it's a bit of an afterthought. And so I wanted to kind of center, center the experience around what I was trying to explore and what was his reality and has been his reality for over a decade. So I'd heard about all these places and tried a few of them myself that had, that had really great um, options. And it's not just one or two, they, they usually have like three or more options that you can pick from. And so we started at a booze-free bottle shop that was having its one-year anniversary party. And we had this really great take on a on a Moscow mule that was delicious there. We bought some products. We headed to another bar that I've been to a lot and had really great natural wines at, but they had this lemonade, this hibiscus lemonade drink that was out of this world and mm. maybe better than other things I'd had. And we ended up at an Italian snack bar that had 15 non-alcoholic options, beer, cocktails um, on the menu. And there, the bartender really knew his stuff. He asked us what he what we liked, what we didn't like, what we were eating, and and he catered the experience for us. What was the best thing? Was it the hibiscus? What was the best thing that you had when you were out there drinking? <sighs> there was one actually I just didn't mention at a whiskey bar that had a it was like a ginger, a ginger and lime kind of concoction that was refreshing and and sippable and just and just a delight. It's very different than the old days if you weren't drinking where if you I mean and your husband would would probably, you know, cop to this as well. If you were out, you'd get a soda water or a cranberry juice or some sort of, you know, near beer that that could peel paint. Those are really different drinks. Yeah, I mean that's really 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 changed. We, like I started dating my husband in 2016 and we'd go to bars and he'd ask what they had um, that wasn't soda or juice. And one time a server even kind of scoffed at us and said, sir, this is a bar. So, and that same place now has a fairly robust offering. But that's part of it as well, right? Like I wonder whether those people who aren't drinking or they just choose not to drink that night, whether they're treated like customers rather than somebody who's just taking up space. Some people take issue a bit with the cost of these drinks. They can be as expensive as an alcoholic cocktail, but you don't even get drunk. Um, but my husband appreciates the fact that these these drinks are prepared with the same level of craft and care and quality of ingredients. And then you don't feel like you're just taking up space with a with a three dollar Perrier. You, it sounds like you had a fairly successful pub crawl. But I mean, broadly, as a consumer, what do you think some of the challenges might be if you're looking for options that don't have alcohol? I think knowing where to find them can be kind of tricky. Uh, Retailers are a little bit confused as to where these products belong. Are they in grocery stores? Are they in corner stores? Are they at liquor stores? Um, so, So finding them like on a reliable regular basis, knowing you can go to a certain place and find a certain product, that can be tricky. And sometimes it's still a new market. So sometimes people try one thing or they tried something a couple of years ago and they didn't like it. And so they're maybe not keen to go back, but there are so many new products, even just Canadian products, like practically every month, it feels like it's worth continuing to check back in. Is there anything in terms of drinks that you're missing from the alcohol side that you can't get yet on the non-alcoholic side? Because there's beers, there's cocktails. What about Things like, you mentioned natural wine. What about wine, for example? There are really good sparklings and whites. Uh, the producers I spoke to said, you know, the sparkling really hides, can, can mask a lot of sins. Mm. But um, the toughest nut to crack is red wine. Um, I read something that said, when you de-alcoholize red wine, it's like you're ripping the backbone out of the drink, uh, which was visceral. But I think it reflects how tricky it is to make that product. Though I have heard that there are some some good products coming out of the guys who do Acid League, the Proxies wine. They have got a new red wine uh, coming out this summer that's apparently going to be a bit of a game changer. Mm. So looking forward to trying that. How has this changed your social situations? I think it's just it's just being more inclusive. I know a lot of sober people through my husband, but I also more and more people who are not drinking and when they come over or we go out when there's more than one person who's not ordering it kind of makes it it makes it okay for for other people not to um and I like that I like that people can choose to do whatever it is they want to do without getting a third degree without being treated like they have a problem or without being subject to you know someone's defensive behavior around their own drinking that they don't have to justify why it is that they're choosing to to have this drink it doesn't it, it's nobody's exactly. business but their own in some ways yeah do you think is this a thing i mean i mentioned the statistics um that uh what 25 percent of canadians are choosing not to drink we're hearing a lot of younger canadians uh aren't drinking perhaps in the same way that older generations might from 
the research that you've done, but also knowing what you know, is, is this a thing? Are people actually drinking less in this country? That's a really great question. Um, and at a population level, with the researchers that I spoke to, not yet. The numbers don't quite reflect it. But anecdotally, and the researchers I spoke to also said that in their own circles, the same thing was happening. There is this wellness movement, uh, you know, thinking about what we're drinking and drinking less, or at least drinking more non-alcoholic things. So I'll be interested to see over the next few years if the statistics start to reflect this anecdotal evidence at a population level. Um, but for right now, it feels like a thing, but the numbers aren't there. You wonder, and I don't know what the alcoholic kind of analogy here, but you, you wonder whether it's kind of a chicken and egg thing, whether the more of those drinks that you had that are available in the places, we're going to talk in just a moment about uh, a mocktail bar, the more places where you can get them, the more people will actually take that step to drink less. Absolutely. And I think also if we can just shake, like if we can just loosen a little bit this idea that alcohol is kind of present and the default at most of our social uh, situations, I think that'll do a lot of good too. Caitlin, thank you very much for this. Thank you, Matt. Caitlin Walsh-Miller is a Montreal-based writer, recently wrote a story about sober culture and sober curious culture in particular for Maclean's magazine. We mentioned those venues where you can get those non-alcoholic drinks. Joanne Pierce is the owner of a soon-to-be mocktail bar in Edmonton, Edmonton's first mocktail bar. It's called Spilt. It opens in June. Joanne, good morning to you. Hi, good morning. Why are you doing this? Why are you opening a bar that has no booze? Well, I think I would have been mad if anybody else did it. Because, <laughs> like, we've been working really, uh, really hard and really meaningfully in this town for a few years now. I've released a couple volumes of recipes, um, have a column on the local show here, have released four bottled products. So I've done the manufacturing thing. So it was actually a developer that approached us about doing brick and mortar. And I was like, well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> and also just to, like, help build the scene. You know, I think people want a gathering place. They want a nucleus. They want a centralized point of knowledge about this topic. They want to know where they can come and, and actually try some of these products and learn and, and sort of get excited and indulge that the, the curious part of Sober Curious. They, they could come to a place where there is an extensive menu of non-alcoholic drinks. But, I mean, you're going all the way. You, you have nothing but non-alcoholic drinks. Why that step? Yeah, it's really interesting. In a lot of the sort of uh, interviews we've done, people are asking, do you think you're going to make it? And I don't know that they would ask any other bar that. Yeah. Um, so that's been interesting. But it's, you know, well, I don't drink. So first of all, it would be weird for me to be serving uh, drinks with alcohol, you know, and there's like thousands of other places that will do that. So I really think that being the first one that that won't serve alcohol sets us apart. It's an advantage in a lot of ways. And it's also such a robust category, like Caitlin was saying. It's, it's growing like crazy. Uh, so I really think that we're going to surprise people with how many options there are. You know, we'll have tasting nights where it's not come try beer, come try wine, come try spirit, but come try three sours side by side, mm. three stouts, three IPAs, and show people just the level of craft and innovation that's happening in this category. Do you mind me asking about your own experience with alcohol and, and, and why you don't drink? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I quit drinking on a whim. I was just like mid pandemic. I, you know, I on a Zoom call, I'd felt the need to like acapella karaoke for people I was meeting for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and, like nothing bad happened, but I just woke up with that little bit of anxiety and the, the mild shame over um, and just decided like, hey, I, you know, I'm kind of over this anxiety. I'm prone to anxiety naturally. Alcohol just exacerbates it. So I quit drinking as a lifestyle choice, but, you know, I've always kind of been a witchy cook and the products that were on the market at the time, especially bottled mocktails, weren't that good. I remember having a Paloma that really just tasted like a diet fresca. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just started boiling all of my spices, which I'm told now was not a normal reaction to quitting drinking. <laughs> <laughs> just like, bring out the cauldron. Um, and I would make things like a, a, an arugula simple syrup. Uh, and I started putting them all together, photographing them. Uh, putting them online, which I was really shy about at first because I thought people were going to assume I was an alcoholic. Uh, but they they were awesome. People were so curious. And and I kind of stumbled into this moment that we're calling the, the soft crush, 
totally by accident. And it's been a wild ride ever since. This is a business decision to open this bar. I mean, aside from from your own experience, and I'm assuming anecdotal stuff as well, what sort of research did you do to figure out the scale of the market for something like this? You know what? It was so hard to do. Um, because like Caitlin was saying, like the numbers aren't there yet, uh, putting together a financing document, even you're trying to find information about the non-elk, you know, growth of the non-elk sector. And all of the numbers you're finding are about soft drinks and coffee. Mm. We're sort of like forging this path. And I think it'll be a lot easier to start a non-elk business, uh, in the future, But honestly, I just did it on instinct. I did it because I feel like it's time. You know, we've kind of done it pop-up style. Um, If people, if Edmonton shows up, then we're going to stay open. And I really think they will. Like we're, we're doing classes. We're also doing offsite catering and Mm. we're booked into the fall of 2025. That's fantastic. It's awesome. What do you, what do you think is going to be different in a place with no alcohol? I mean, I, I can have an idea as to what that might be, but from your perspective, how do you think the bar will be different? Well, it's uh, like we've thrown a few test parties in there to kind of work out the kinks, and it's been fascinating. Uh, you, it's it's really a different way of socializing. So everybody comes in in their little groups of two or three, and and you can feel that everybody's a little bit awkward at first, and they're all just kind of talking to to each other. Um, and, and But everybody's surfing that wave of awkwardness together. And the thing about alcohol is it allows you to have this sort of myopic focus on whoever you're talking to. It blurs all the edges. So you're kind of only thinking about one thing at a time. Take that away and you're aware of everything. You're aware of the whole room. You know, you have no blinders on. So you see the conversations start to weave into each other. And you see this group of strangers that, that came in not knowing each other, all of a sudden they're talking to each other. And every single time, without fail, every night that we've had an event, it ends up in a big group discussion. Mm. So it's kind of like all the best parts of like a smoke pit. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's why I used to like smoking, because you would go out and you would talk to strangers. Kind of like that mixed with a dinner party. And and everybody leaves friends. We had an event last night and you know, we're all standing in a circle by the door at the end and, and sharing, you know, insecurities about imposter syndrome. And it's this group of strangers. And you would never see that in a regular bar. It's interesting because Caitlin hinted at this. For a lot of people, alcohol is kind of the default uh, part of a social interaction. You go to somebody's house, you go to a bar, you have a drink. What would you say to people who would say that, I mean, this social is like a social lubricant in some ways is a good thing. And that if you take that out, it can change the experience of going to a, a place like a bar. And that might not be a good thing. A hundred percent. You know what? I, I miss that. I miss the two, three drink buzz uh, because it does allow you to get from A to C without going through B. <laughs> like, it allows you to skip a step in connecting to people. Mm. Um, so, so, it's this muscle of muscling through the discomfort that you get a lot better at when you quit drinking, but not everybody is as flexed in that area. So that can be hard for a lot of people. Also something to talk about that's interesting is like when, when friends quit drinking, that can also tear the social fabric a little bit. Because they're left out. Because they, they can't sort of connect in the same way as maybe they used to with their drinking buddies. Mm. So I think we, we all have to learn and sort of catch up to this paradigm shift that's happened very quickly um, and and be gentle with each other and just know that it might take a minute. So when I come to Edmonton next and I come to Spilt, what are you going to shake up or stir up for me? I'm really into uh, this, this beautiful sort of hemp and bitter Amaro-based spirit right now called Pathfinder. Ooh. And I would do that with, uh, I think, a BB bitter aperitivo soda, which is from Toronto, uh, stap each and note. So basically, I would layer about five layers of orange bitter for you. Do you like Negronis? I love Negronis. Uh, see, I could just tell. So <laughs> <laughs> I would mix all that up and I would finish it up. This is a drink that's going on our menu. Uh, I finish it off with uh, a tea made out of juniper and spruce tip and licorice root and do the orange zest expressed over the top. You would love it. That sounds delicious. It is. (laughs) Good luck, and thanks for talking to us. 
Thank you so much. Joanne Pierce is the owner of Spilt Mocktail Bar in Edmonton. It opens its doors officially on the 9th of June. Jack Martike has an event planning company. It's called The Party Scientist. His events are alcohol and smartphone free. He joins us from Vancouver. Jack, good morning to you. Hey, Matt. Are you ready to fly out for a sober rave or what? Alcohol and smartphone <laughs> free. Perish the thought. <laughs> yeah, that's that's quite alarming for a lot of people since it's it's so normal, right? It's so normal to look at our phones every 15 seconds while we're socializing. And it's so normal to uh, drink poison as well, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, we'll get to the poison piece in a moment. Um, describe w- what your parties are like. If, if somebody were to come and land at one of your events, what's happening? People arrive and immediately they're greeted and they're welcomed and they're acknowledged. That's not often the case at a normal party. And then there's a lot of group activity, whether that's games, whether that's vulnerability exercises. Really, the whole party is a self-development experience where we're developing our ability to create natural joy. And natural joy is drug-free, it's alcohol-free, it's smartphone-free, and it's a really important skill. And unfortunately, what I've come to learn is that alcohol atrophies these skills of creating natural joy. Tell me about that. I mean, again, you refer to it specifically as a poison, um, which is a health thing, but I mean, that could also be taken as, as something that's toxic in terms of how we interact. Why do you use that word? I use it because when I was a medic at music festivals uh, and music festivals like are really a peak experience. They're a peak celebration. It's all about being in community and celebrating our aliveness as human beings. And I witnessed the exact opposite. I witnessed it get tainted by this toxic party culture um, where young people had to drink and do drugs to find the joy that they were looking for. How, how have you figured that out? Because one of the things, I mean, and to your point, you go to a social event, people are drinking, but people are also standing around with their friends, not talking to their friends, but looking at the phone. So how did you figure out how to how to foster a natural human connection, if I can put it that way? It's natural because this is how we connected before the smartphone existed. I I used to call myself the banana from Canada, and I would travel Europe and Mexico, and I've traveled to about 15 countries with the loudest portable speaker on earth. I would put a microphone on myself, and I would challenge myself to get groups of humans of strangers to dance and i successfully did it and led parades in a lot of cities and in a lot of cases uh, they were shut down by (laughs) by the authorities we started in talking about the number of, of people who aren't drinking right now is this being reflected in the work that you're doing are you seeing a different cohort of people, a different community of people, more people showing up at these events because of a decrease in the number of people perhaps who who are turning to just going to a bar and having a drink? Well, I have a WhatsApp group in Vancouver with 2,200 people in it. I think it is growing, but I think it's more so it's because people are becoming more health conscious. They're not necessarily becoming sober more often. I I really think there's this, you know, it's the mindfulness revolution, Mm -hmm. right? There's this rise happening in consciousness. We see that with the popularity of, of meditation apps, but, uh, yeah, I, I attract a certain type of open-minded person, right? Who's kind of working on themselves. You're doing something that I think a lot of people may be interested in right now, given uh, what we were just speaking about in terms of the number of people who are perhaps uh, steering away from traditional ways of, of having a great time. Chuck, thank you very much. Yeah, see you at the high grave. Chuck Martike is uh, an event planning company operator. The company is called The Party Scientist. He was in Vancouver. If you've given up drinking or thought about it, tell us about that and tell us about the effect that it's had. What's changed in your life? You can email us, thecurrent at cbc.ca.